Well, could we send then something around and everybody that supports it sign it? I mean, I really think as a new American task force, we have to take a stand. If we don't take a stand on this, what are we taking a stand on? Well, when, when I first came to Lincoln uh, six years ago, the way refugee resettlement was explained to me that if there's an international incident mm -hmm. taking place in, around the world, mm -hmm. within 18 months to two years, we'll see families from those countries here. Yeah. And so just in the years that I've been superintendent, you know, Burma has, has uh, Iraq has been highly represented. Lutheran Family Service is reporting October arrivals uh, 19 people, 17 Iraqis, one African and one Russian. We've been scheduled for, so far for 13 people in November, and I hope that number stays the same because we are just 10 days before the end of it. But sometimes arrival notice can be very short. And we've been scheduled in December for seven people so far, uh, five families. Family of five in Grand Island from Sudan and one big family of seven from Iraq and one Burmese client. Thank you. Report from LPS. Okay. We should have one that Dr. Hicks passed around. This is just a pretty basic report looking at, you can see at the top, the current total number of students that are being served in ELL. Um, this doesn't divide out by schools or language groups. This just kind of breaks down based on the immigrant and refugee populations that have come in, not taking into account like what we refer to as the secondary migrants moving from other states. So that would definitely increase to these numbers as well. My name is Kalpana Gurun. I was born in refugee camp in Nepal. It's like our parents were kicked out from their original country, which was Bhutan. And life in refugee camp was really hard. My name is Berta Vicente Tiño. My place is Kansas. I tengo cuatro años. Me fui de Guatemala. Y estuve 11 años ahí, regresé aquí en los Estados Unidos, me bajé aquí en Nebraska. I'm Mani Pura, I'm 19 years old. I'm 19 years old. My name is Hebli Tu, I was born in the refugee camp in Thailand. My name is Marcelina Antiwas, I am from the Marshall Island. Yo mi me sabha boklo, yo o hele, yo como, yo po yega, de... We are mainly in the business of helping students learn English as fast as they can through the ELL, English Language Learners Program, so that they can succeed academically, so that they can graduate, so that they can become productive members of society. It doesn't matter if they have documentation, it doesn't matter where they were born, it doesn't matter what language they speak. If they live within our school district boundaries, we are required to provide a free education until age 21, or they graduate. So once these families show up at the new Welcome Center, we know that we have to be ready to serve them. They are welcomed by a bilingual liaison who speak their language. The bilingual liaison in the family fill out all of the paperwork, census information, health history, prior education, special education needs, pretty much everything that has to do with the educational development of that child. And then the last grade that you finished in California. California. 
while that is taking place, there is the assessment person who comes and takes that child to another room to determine their level of skills in the English language. And then for you, Esther, you will write about a day that you want to remember. In the area of reading, writing, and math. So this gives us an understanding of what type of support we need to give them. You guys did excellent. You should be very proud of yourselves. Each family has a dream and has a definition of education, no matter where they come from, no matter their educational backgrounds, they will want the best for their children. He had an axe, he cut down trees. All the states that touch Oklahoma. Kansas, Texas. I am Ron. You need an ING. You need an ING. Very good. Pain. Glass in a window. Find the definition that means glass in the window. Everybody together, go, went. Make, made. Run, ran. Say, my job, I think, is really multifaceted and, and quite uh, exciting. Um, you're the person at the school who the kids are building the closest relationship with. You're the person at the school who is trying to help them navigate this new culture, the language, um, survive in their classes um, when they're surrounded by things that they really have never been exposed to before. When I arrived here, it was like so different. I felt so different. I see so many other people that I have never seen in my life. There were white peoples and African peoples. Nobody looked like us, you know? They were so different. Our job is to help improve their speaking skills, their listening skills, their reading skills, and their writing skills, because they need all of those in order to um, make it in the American culture. Just go like this, everybody. Put it in a pile, let's look at another problem. 43% of our school speaks another language at home, so really all the teachers here are ESL teachers. And you have to write the words, they're gonna be all mixed up, into a correct sentence. Number two could be our, but it says they. An ESL teacher is, a, first and foremost, they are certified either in elementary education or an area of secondary education. Often they have a theatrical bent because you're acting out concepts for our students. Ooh, yeah, it's that ooh sound. You know how to express yourself so that students can understand what you're saying even though they are in the process of learning English. How much English did you know when you moved here? Not very much. It was a struggle for me. I was 11 when I came to the U.S. Making new friends, that was a big challenge since I, just, I barely speak any English. All I knew was my name, my age, and simple things like how old, are you, how old are you or how are you, and that was it. One time, like, I went to get a lunch, right, and the lady asked me, what do you want? And I don't know the name of the foods, right? And I pointed at that, this one, and then she called me stupid of not knowing the name of the food. Now, you can help each other, but if your team members are helping you and it's not in English, you I know our society tends to say, well, why don't they just learn English? Well. Learning a leather language is extremely difficult. When you're acquiring language, you learn how to speak socially much more quickly. Maybe a year and a half to three years, you learn how to ask somebody's name, find out what's for lunch, what did you do this weekend. But surviving in a classroom takes much longer. And that's the confusing part because the student might be able to come up and have a, a conversation with you informally but as soon as you start lecturing on photosynthesis or talk about the Revolutionary War, they, they don't understand the, the language. Okay. All right. Perimeter is two times the length plus two times the width. All right. What's the length? So those academic terms, they say it takes about seven to ten years to gain a mastery of that. 
So if you think about it, if you move here in 10th grade, that only gives you three. Are in a week. There are seven days in a week. Do you agree or disagree? Agree. I agree as well. Wonderful. School in Nepal was like made out of bamboo and mud. They had so many classes, like here. They had history classes, mathematic class, and then English. I would say that any education you're getting in the camp yeah. is not what we would consider to be um, formal. It's not what we would expect. It's not what, in the United States, it's not what we would consider to be comprehensive. Guatemala no es igual de aquí, pues, que hace de lenguajes, mm -hmm. naturaleza, sociales, físicas. Um, formación ciudadana y de todo juego, que aquí es diferente, solo que haces tu tarea, ya tocas de break, ya vas a comer y después regresas a clase. Pero en Guatemala es, entras a las 8 de la mañana, sales a las 10 de la mañana, tu refacción, galletas, como una hora de física. Entonces ya a las 11 entras y a las 12 se termina toda la clase. Pero como nosotros no tenemos dinero para ir a, a estudiar mucho, por eso que ahí tardamos del sexto grado. You know, we have students coming with very severely limited formal schooling who really just need ABCs. I mean, that's where they're starting. And then we have kids, um, we have one student um, from, from Brazil who, you know, he's had a fair amount, not a fair, an incredible amount of schooling in his home country. He just needs to transfer that into English. There are a lot of different strategies that teachers can use to help students who are learning another language. One of the most important is get them to speak and interact. What did your mother make for dinner last night? She made nice. fried chicken. Oh, she made fried chicken? Awesome. Getting kids out of their seats, getting them to work with partners, getting them to work with partners who speak different languages, so they're really forced to kind of listen to each other. Then what we're going to do is you're going to switch sentences with your partner, and your partner is going to read your sentence to the class, uh -huh. and you are going to read your partner's sentence to the class. Okay, Pathu. Mary went to the movie, but she doesn't have money. Nice. We have a um, first year newcomer from Honduras. The classroom teacher sat him right next to another Spanish speaking student. And so she'll be teaching in English and this other student who's been at Kellum since kindergarten and speaks Spanish will be teaching our newcomer in Spanish. Abe worked hard, okay. but he, he went wanted to learn. to learn, okay? All right, it looks like everybody's done. We'll sing a lot of songs because singing in a new language is a great way to learn it. And it's sometimes the first words that they'll speak will be in a song. I am going to read it out loud to you first. Because I think the answers will be easier if you actually hear it read first. Some of you struggle with the answers. Before the government opened Oklahoma to white people during the 1880s. So now you can answer the questions. His name. Your name is Juan. What is his name? Will Rogers was a famous Oklahoma entertainer. What is his name? No, oh, you're looking the wrong one. I read the other one. Will no. Rogers was a famous... Will. There you Will. go. Will. Yeah. I think the level, ability level they have is what's most surprising to me. It's basically like starting from scratch. So we're trying to teach uh, high school level academics to somebody who has maybe gone to second grade. So right now they are doing vocabulary on globes and like okay. the difference between flat and round and the difference between a globe and a map. 
I think sometimes for a system like us, it's growing so rapidly and, and there's so much pressure on us to uh, have these kids be at grade level as quickly as possible. You know, I mean, when we look at state assessments and of course federal benchmarks, you, you, don't, you don't get much of a cushion for a family or a child that comes here that doesn't speak English and is 13 years of age. They have to advance themselves or, the, or you know, the school district gets a knock and then certainly to graduate within four years of the time they get here as well too. So we feel a little bit of pressure with regard to that. At least the first page done. Stretch your brain today. These children's view of education is totally different. Their perception. Once they reach Lincoln Public Schools, once they reach a public school system in the, in the United States, imagine the culture shock that goes with that. Here you have a child who has seen school as a place where they can interact with one another, a place where they can play, a place where they can understand each other, a place where they can run around. And now imagine a place where don't, they don't speak the language, a place that has a structure, a place that has rules. Now they become depressed. Now, they don't know what to do. Now, they don't want to go to school. It's a foreign environment. It is already a struggle in our hometowns, in our villages, in our outskirts communities. It is a struggle, but we have learned how to navigate that system that we have created but now we are displaced and to a certain extent misplaced into another world. Um, everything was strange. Uh, I didn't have any friends. Everything was different from what I'm used to. So it was a, it was a moment of uh, like disbelief that I am here, that I don't know what I was gonna do or how I'm gonna get through. America. Okay, it is set in a gen. As I'm teaching the kids, it becomes more evident what their cultural perspective is and how it differs dramatically from the American culture. If you've traveled in Latin America or you've been to the islands, they have this beach time or Latin American time, which is dramatically different from the American concept of time. So getting to school on time is difficult. <laughs> our weather is a big issue. They, most of our refugees come from places that have a much warmer climate. So just coming to the United States and having appropriate clothing, staying healthy, uh, eating um, foods that are, are available to them here but are also healthy are all things that they have to learn. I know when we've uh, helped families in their apartment the first time, they don't know what a refrigerator is used for because they've not had that in a refugee camp. They don't know about a microwave, about a stove, about a fire alarm. So you cannot assume that students or their families know about how to live successfully in the United States because their previous experience has been so different. You know, you, you always say you meet the student at the door. Well, here you meet the family at the door. Um, and our arms have to wrap around that family and really try to um, build a relationship with them so they trust us. And then once they trust us, then we're, we're able to more get a sense of what they need from us. Like, you know, how do you support your child at home with homework? They don't, they don't know that. I have the privilege of working with 23 bilingual liaisons who speak more than 13 different languages. We are the cultural brokers for the district. We provide language services for the families, for the staff, the administrators who work directly with these families. They are the link of everything that happens 
in the life of that student in the classroom and to a certain extent what happens outside of the classroom. In order for our students to be successful, we need to help parents be successful here because it's part of our partnership with the parents and the family. Not only can they learn English, but they can learn about how to be an effective parent in the United States and how to support their children in school. So like at home, what she, help, she need to help the son, like extra sport. Reading books that he can read over and over. Or just pointing at words in a book. As well as learn to sew, or learn to use computers, or improve their skills so they can get a better job. You get to know these kids well because many times um, their parents aren't able to advocate for them the way an American parent would. They don't have the language, they are working, so they might come to you with questions about their schedule or counseling or Medicaid. You know, no one in my family knows how to fill out this paperwork. What are we supposed to do? I am looking at a child that has come to this community without any say as to why she or why he is here. And they didn't have a say here. They, they just, they had to come. They had to travel. They had to expose themselves to danger in order to survive. We see these kids all the time. When I came here, there were no students who didn't have white skin, absolutely none. And to now, our Latino population is the majority. I'm not sure at what point I stopped realizing that I was thinking of students in two groups and that wasn't Latino and non-Latino, it was students who knew English fluently and students who didn't. Yosjin, keep going, you only have about five more. They're all here. Teenagers are teenagers, it's pretty much the same. A lot of my students actually work, so they'll come and they'll be super tired or they'll just tell me straight up one day, like, I'm so tired, I don't want to work today. I'm like, all right got to at least try and make progress. I'll work with you. If you don't get this done, I'll give you extra time. But that's my biggest issue probably, that or the parents are always working and they're always basically taking the role of watching their siblings and taking care of them. From our experience here in, in Chadron, uh, I can tell you this, we were not prepared for an ELL population coming in 15 years ago and growing from uh, one little baby, a one-year-old baby, into um, nearly 40 students that speak Marshallese. I, I can just tell you we weren't prepared. Unlike most of our student body, when, when the Marshallese students go home at night, there's no biological parent. I live with the Watsox family. He's my uncle, I'm about 10. People lives in the house. I just visited with one of our, our young ladies, um, and she hasn't spoke with her biological mother since she's been in the United States. So those are those are some of the challenges that we're uh, that we have um, that we're trying to find ways to help these kids. In Lutheran Omaha, they do have some mental health services, and, and Patrice may be able to talk more about that. As people come in, she screens everybody, and. Um, and then she works directly with people who need um, more intensive services. With Lincoln Public Schools, now that they've also started this new trauma program, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to make everything work. We have students from Burma who have experienced genocide. We have newly arrived students from Syria who are running away, fleeing violence in order to survive. We have kids from Sudan 
who may have seen horrible things. We have Latino families who are still struggling. How do I help these children? How do I help these kids? Focus on math. When many of them are still back in memory, thinking about what they left off. At him, just tell him to go time out or to go to... We had a student from the Middle East who had been kidnapped while he was young and been held for ransom. And then he was eventually returned, but was not able to get any therapy. And to this day, you know, it caused, I mean, significant trauma that he was never able to fully deal with. And it, you know, he was really charming and very articulate, but there were huge emotional gaps there that I don't think were ever able to be talked about. There were two boys who were here, and I think it was right after they had arrived from the United States, and um, they were from the Middle East as well, and their father had been working with the military, I think, um, doing some translating, and their sister had been kidnapped and then shot over the phone while they were listening. And, you know, it's stuff that you, you hear that and you think, school doesn't matter, you know? What matters after that? Well, in refugee camp, you can't really go out of the gated community where they have barbed wire around the, the refugee camp. If you get caught going out of those places, you can get arrested, thrown into jail, or get deported back to uh, Burma, where it's even worse. Lo looking back, it wasn't, it wasn't normal to live like that. I mean, you live under a, a barbed wire. You live in, inside a barbed wire. I can't picture you know, my I had a student come, he had been at a refugee camp in Thailand, and he was very shy, he was, seemed very nervous, which is completely understandable. He had been through a lot of hard times, and he had, at his old school, now he's been able to tell me if he got the answer wrong, or maybe he didn't know how to write something, they would physically discipline him, and he said it was very sad and very hard and kind of embarrassing. And so I was able to pull another student aside who speaks his language, which is Corinne, and have him tell this new student that here at Kellum, we're a safe school. It's okay to get the answer wrong, and it's okay to say something wrong. We want you to try to start talking. I had a student, um, I was reading an essay that she was writing for college, and she was talking about being young and having to flee one of the refugee camps and um, being in the forest and the, the soldiers were hunting them and her parents were terrified and she didn't know if they were gonna um, make it. All I was focusing on was sentence fluency and punctuation and where to indent paragraphs. And I just stopped myself thinking, you know, like, have, have I become desensitized to these stories? Do the, are these stories so commonplace now that I don't even stop and pause myself with this horrific tale from a teenage girl? I do think it's really important that we do stop and let ourselves be heartbroken and let ourselves be astounded and overwhelmed by, you know, the horrificness because I remember stopping and rereading that story and I ended up in tears because it was terrible. And then I thought about where she was now and how she was going to college and she was so happy and, you know, articulate and bright. And, you know, there are so many kids who don't end up with that kind of light after experiencing that kind of darkness. Yes, that is correct. Uh-huh. Even though there's been challenges with us trying to find resources of how to bridge the, the language barrier, this is a, a population of students that I just love taking care of because they give us a lot of effort in the classroom. They're involved in activities outside of the classroom. Just a great group of students, and, and they're worth all the attention we can give them. I have the ability to help refugee and immigrant families when they come to Omaha. I am able to help their children have a quality education in the Omaha Public Schools. I'm able to help their parents learn English and help them uh, learn about being a good parent and hopefully help them uh, have a good life here in the United States. And so I feel very blessed. Even if 
your experience coming to another country is perfect, you know? It's still traumatic to learn a new language, to be in a new culture, to be away from what you're familiar with. And most of our kids have not had, you know, perfect situations. And so I think the level of resiliency is so incredible to see people who are engaging in life with a real purpose. I feel very privileged, you know, to be able to be a part of that. Okay, this group kind of won. What do you want to do after you graduate from college? What what kind of what kind of work do you think you want to do? What do you want to be when you grow up? Doctor. <laughs> a doctor? Yeah. No. The same. <laughs> the same? I haven't really decided on whether I want to do human resource or or uh, social work. I'm drawn towards both of them, but have it decided which one I'm leaning toward. My grandma, she told me that become a flight attendant so you can take me to everywhere I want to be. I was like, okay, and I promise that. My plans for the future is like to go to college and get a good job and look after my family and make my family feel proud of having me. Mi futuro ha pensado yo a estudiar y sacar mi graduación y después si Dios permite sacar un una otra práctica de, de enfermera o de o de una secretaria todo eso y eso es lo que Life, I think. Life has gotten better than in refugee camp. If you wish for anything, you can do it, I think. Like, America is land of opportunity, so we are right here. We have got a lot of things to do, and I'm hoping on it. One, two, three! I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all.